Nyman på hyllan 1973. Samma år för övrigt som han vann sin tredje världsmästartitel. Han själv, hans vänner och konkurrenter berättar om en fantastisk karriär. Om vad det är som gör en idrottsman till en idrottsprofil. I en brittisk dokumentär i fyra delar som startar här och nu. Good evening. Tonight we're going to focus our cameras on one of the world's most exciting sportsmen, the flying Scot, Jackie Stewart. Some people believe they've got to think of themselves as the best in order to succeed. I never ever thought that. I was always thinking I wasn't going to win. I was always thinking that everybody else is better than me. When he's driving well, in tune with everything, he can see people in the audience. He can tell faces in the crowd. You can argue until you're blue in the face about whether Fangio was better, whether Jim Clark was better, whether Sterling Moss was better. That's irrelevant. He's the greatest motor racing personality of all time. A good racing driver doesn't really look like he's going that fast, but in fact it's a clean, smooth, progressive performance that supplies the real speed. I think I lived at a time when it was the best. The whole thing just, there were very good years, very full years, very effervescent years. Everything was champagne. Farming was on one side of the family. Gamekeeping was on the other side of the family. My grandfather, Stuart, um, was a gamekeeper. Mum and Dad uh, were good people, um, strong values, quite disciplined. Mother was tough. She was the one that would take no nonsense and would want everything to be seen and done correctly. In this very room, I was born on uh, a table, which is certainly not this one, it was an oak table. Um, and my brother also was born in this house. The reason for the house being here was the fact that my father was going to have a garage there and it was a very busy road and it sold petrol and that's where he made his money and then he had a little workshop and then he occasionally sold the odd car. Five miles away is John Brown's shipyard. The bombing of the Clyde was a, a big deal for um, the German Air Force. And I can remember, I must have been very young, but I can always remember the sirens. And you would hear the bombs. As children, we didn't really get to know one another terribly well. It was only when I, I got into my teens that I realized that I had a young brother which was becoming a bit of a nuisance to me. Oh, school was such a bad time. I mean, that's the unhappiest times of my life by a farmer's mile. I mean, nothing close in my life has ever been so depressing and so destructive and so uh, uh, affecting. Mentally abusive, ever. 
And I remember on one occasion, the headmaster seeing my parents one night and saying, really, we're very worried about Jackie because his reading is terribly behind. His, his spelling is absolutely deplorable. And yet he's not a stupid boy. And I just thought I was stupid. I mean, I was told I was stupid, dumb or thick. And they were right by comparison to the other people in my class. And that hurt badly. And my school reports were terrible. And my father mother got the hold of Jack and said, you know, pulled him aside and said, look, you've got to work hard at school. This is absolutely ridiculous. Turned out later to find out that I was dyslexic and, and quite severely dyslexic. So my consumption of information at school was very poor. It was therefore with enormous relief that I got out of school and went into the garage and the first job you got was serving petrol. Everybody had to check the oil and check the battery and check the water fluids and check the tires quite often. thinking a minute about the house and we were sitting now in that porthole at the back, <laughs> which, by the way, that's the same stained glass yes, that we yes. had, which, um, by the way, mm. gets easily taken out because yeah, there yeah. was a that's period right. of time when I my spy. mother... Remember, mother used to Correct. get that out there so exactly she could see if saying. anybody wasn't being served at the petrol right, station. Right. So you would get a call to say, that's there's right. four cars waiting and nobody's serving. That's exactly, that's right. exactly. That's right. It was about that time that I started going motor racing. Jackie, by this time, was coming along with me to most of the hill climb events that I was participating in. And for your big brother to be driving racing cars was a pretty big deal, a kind of hero figure. I remember you coming back from Jagger saying that you had seen, was it Bill Haley in the Comets? Oh. Remember he had a sort of curl in his, in his forehead. That's right, that's right. And that was when the twist started. One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. That's, that's that was it. Bill Haley. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're going to rock around the clock tonight. But it's that right, so join me. Radio Cafe in Helens, but that time, was the centre of the action. It was all young people. It was open at night. You, you went in there, and it was a jukebox, and it was a great place. I was going to be on a blind date, and um, this girl was at the table and didn't fancy me at all, and uh, decided that I wasn't the one she was going out with that night, and Helen happened to be there. So I went out to make up the foursome that night. I think we all had dinner together, and it was no big love affair or anything like that, but I was very impressed by his manners. He was very correct in everything he did, and the way he treated me, I thought, well, this is nice. And I think that's why I fell in love with him, because of the way he was with me. And Helen and I went out, I think Helen was 16, and I must have been nearly 18. We would occasionally go to the movies, whether it be in Glasgow or whether it be in Helen's, but it was a big deal to go to Glasgow, and it wasn't that far. But uh, they were more expensive, the seats in Glasgow, in the cinema than they were, or the picture house, as it was called. I was in a car going somewhere with him, and he said, um, when you're 21, I think we'll get engaged. What do you think? I said, OK. And that was the proposal. He never actually asked me. <laughs> he didn't get down his hands and knees and said, will you marry me? He never said, will you marry me? So anyway, that was it. <laughs> For me, life was already, that was it. That was all cut out. That was my life. I didn't think beyond that. Grandfather Stuart was a gamekeeper. My father was brought up shooting and fishing. I was brought up shooting and fishing. Shooting really was the single most important thing in my life. Um, it was the first thing I was good at, the first thing I was given credit for in the fullest sense. 
Jackie felt at that time he was being somewhat overlooked. And he felt, if I am successful as a clear pigeon shooter, I want to be really successful. And I was shooting for Great Britain. I shot for Scotland first and won the Scottish, the English, the Irish, the Welsh, the British championships, won the Coupe de Nation, which is European and Mediterranean championship, a couple of times. My largest disappointment in my life was not making the Olympic team to go to Rome in 1960. I lost my position for the Olympic team on my 21st birthday, on the final trials. For no good reason, I just lost my timing. And I lost my position by one target. I had bought him this beautiful pair of cufflinks, and it was more than I can afford, and, and I could afford at that time. And he was so pleased with them, but not even that could satisfy his unhappiness. He was absolutely miserable. During my shooting career, I had always kept photographs or memorabilia, and Helen started to put together an amazing collection of scrap albums, you would call them, I suppose. His mother had a lot of things, and I thought, oh, I could put something together here. I don't know, it was just basically to tidy things up a bit. It's quite nice to have documented it. But then Jackie, by this time, was getting to the stage where he had a driving license of his own. And of course, it wasn't before long that he showed interest in himself racing. How we were going to keep this away from our mother in particular was the difficult situation because she was virtually having nervous breakdowns every time I went motor racing. And I thought, my God, if Jackie were to start, it would be even worse. I had to race under the nom de plume, the pseudonym, of a n other, an other. And I did that quite a while, actually, before it started to creep out. And when it did start to creep out, she never read the paper, she said. In this house, my driving career was never, ever discussed. My mother never accepted that I was a racing driver, never recognised it because I cheated her. And if I cheated her, why should she know? When she realised that Jackie was being serious about her motor racing, I think she took a certain hate towards him. It's a terrible thing to say, but I think she did. From small races in 1961, 62 to 63, club racing in England, suddenly I was the most successful club racer in England. And I think I won something like 15 out of 23 races. He had this very natural talent to drive race cars. But I think above all was this mark of determination in life to succeed. His goal was to be a top line racing driver. And my heart sort of sank. I thought, a racing driver? I didn't marry a racing driver. Then I thought, well, maybe it'd be quite exciting. I don't know anything about it. When Ken Tyrrell asked me to drive in March for a test at the Goodwood circuit, that suddenly opened a whole new doorway. Well, it started with a phone call from the track manager at uh, Goodwood, who called me up and uh, said, uh, uh, Katie said, I know you're always looking for young drivers that look promising, and, uh, and I've seen this young Scotsman going round. And so um, I invited Jackie down for a test drive, and uh, he, he had never driven a single-seater car before. And when I drove that car, it was suddenly like sitting in a duel and it was so tidy and so precise and so compelling to drive that I, I happened to go very well in it. He took that car around Goodwood quicker than anyone else had done before. And at that time, Bruce McLaren, an established Formula One driver, was the test driver for the car. 
you'd have to be an idiot not to recognize the talent. From that point on, suddenly my life changed. When I went back to his factory, it turned out to be a wooden hut. I remember when I came here for the first time, it was a purpose built as far as I was concerned. <laughs> High energy, state of the art, big time racing team. If you think what's happened from this building, it's incredible. Yes, but what is what a difference to today. Well, what a difference to the McLaren setup, for example, the, the new factory that they're building. It's got its own lake, it's got its own uh, wind tunnel. It's uh, going to be a fabulous enterprise, costing millions. I would have thought it's going to cost uh, at least £350 million. Pounds. What yeah. did this cost? 25 quid, I think. <laughs> Jackie had won, I think, every race that he'd taken part in before uh, the Monaco Formula 3 event. Really, the only thing that he and I discussed, I think, was me telling him to take it slow enough, to take it slow enough to win, uh, uh, because uh, it, it was going to be important for his future career. I watched the Formula 3 race and I noticed that there was either somebody a long way last or a hell of a long way in front. As I watched, he got further in front and I realised it was Jackie. And I won the race. <laughs> I sat next to the Princess Grace and Helen sat next to Prince Rainier the night after the F3 race at the, the Grand Ball. And, you know, I never dreamt that I would ever be doing things like that. And Princess Grace was very special. When 65 came around, suddenly I was a Formula One driver. I was a Grand Prix driver. I was driving for BRM with a really slick transporter and Graham Hill is my teammate and everybody was very professional and you, you had to go testing. And... Very intoxicating. He seemed to settle in quite well. He obviously was a a little bit shy and a little bit nervous, but he soon got over that. Once he got in the car and the flag fell, you got 101% out of him. Jackie would stick his neck out. Jackie would have a go. And then I won the Daily Express International Trophy race. That year was my first year uh, at Silverstone, beating John Surtees and he was a world champion. The people I raced against, I was always surprised that I went as fast or faster than them. And it was somewhat of a shock because some of these people were my heroes. Graham Hill was uh, larger than life, really, in, in many ways. I don't, there's nobody even close today to what Graham Hill was as a character. Uh, he was very polished. You know, having somebody like me arrive into a team couldn't have been an easy thing to face because it, there's quite a few racetracks. I was quicker than Graham straight away. Graham recognised that the challenge was coming from Jackie. He, he, never, he never really showed it, but I could sense it. There they were, miles ahead of everybody else. And the cars were running beautifully. And what do they do? The idiots raced each other. And I, I tried everything I could to stop them. And they, they just kept on at it. 
Graham went wide onto the loose stuff. It cost him two or three seconds. Jackie came over the line in the lead. And he came in, he won his first world championship race. He couldn't understand why we weren't all clapping him on the back and saying, wonderful, you know, you idiot. <laughs> The swinging 60s were a fantastic time. I had just started marriage, I had just started motor racing, but the sport was incredibly dangerous in those days. I had an accident in 66 that was certainly to change my life on the basis of my awareness to safety and the lack of it. And Graham, in fact, rescued me racing and um, I just lifted off but it was too late I lost it and around I went I went going down the road backwards and I just got it to a stop by the side of some railings and I started looking for the gear I think the gear was this and as I looked down I thought back on me I said there's Jackie down there in a, in a car and I thought oh god he doesn't look so good it's a bit second hand so he, you know I could see he was in some sort of trouble so I jumped out of the car and there of course he was trapped it was bent like a banana around the buttress of a big stone barn and it had forced the steering wheel down over his knees. And Jackie was sitting sort of halfway up to his waist in fuel. And there was no marshals or emergency people and they had to borrow spanners from a spectator's car to get the steering wheel off and finally got a an ambulance and finally got me to a hospital after the police escort had lost their way and the ambulance had lost the police escort. But I never forget being laid down on the stretcher on a concrete floor littered with cigarette ends. And this was the condition of a place that was supposed to be a medical facility. And my motor racing career was going like a rocket ship. It was just an amazingly exciting time. BRM had lost its way. I was struggling, you know, never to win a race, but just to try and get an odd podium or be behind the leaders. I didn't like that. In the meantime, Ken Terrell, he was saying, you know, you should come and drive for me. I said, Ken, you don't have a Formula One car or a team. I'd love to. He said, well, what if I got one? Ken said to me that he had heard that Ferrari were after Jackie. And it was like bringing the British Empire to an end if, or the Scottish Empire or whatever, if Jackie Stewart should go to Ferrari. We couldn't possibly have that. It was really the, the, the association with Ken Tyrrell that brought Jackie's name to, to the forefront. Uh, it, it was a quite incredible association, the like of which there's never been in motor racing before. But we had no experience of Formula One, and I was very surprised um, that he decided to go with us. It's a question I've never asked him, actually, as to why he did that. I must remember to do that sometime. 